Hello, Voyagers. This is a condensed version of the hackathon presentation. After this quick intro, where I give you the cliff notes, you can go to the description or use the chapters to learn more about the projects that interest you most. Links for these projects are also included in the description. Do note that while some of these are current working projects, use caution and do your own research as they are still in development, but there are some really exciting things happening. Starting in order of presentation, we have ARC72 NFT Indexer, developed by MG, Easy Tiger, and Flipping Algos. This platform allows both users and dApps to have NFT data easily available, APIs to read and write data, as well as end users to call Git methods from the database. Aramid Finance Cross-Chain Bridge, developed by Ludo, this is a cross-chain bridge that allows its own Aramid chain and nodes, referred to as soldiers or guardians, and KYC'd multi-sig signatories to confirm transactions for virtually any token to cross-chain, connecting VOI to Algorand, NIR, and EVM chains with the current working product. Tower Bridge State-Proof ASA Bridge, developed by Benedict, Kirian, and Zarmian. Tower Bridge is a state-proof bridge, meaning it requires no nodes or consensus outside of the blockchains it supports, giving it decentralized bridging via the native consensus of the chains it connects. This does require slower bridging transactions, currently 256 blocks on Algorand or VOI, which comes to about 14 minutes. This, however, can be made quicker with DeFi stakers taking on the risk by pre-validating tokens to bridgers for a small fee as they wait for the full 256 blocks to resolve. Additionally, the second part of this project is Weaver, which is a state-proof verification of transactions. This is applicable for not only bridging, but also for any future applications that need confirmation a transaction has occurred, especially with transactions occurring between networks. HighForge NFT Launchpad, developed by Mitch and Aust. HighForge is an NFT launchpad that gives a variety of customizations and tools for NFT creators to launch NFTs and their combined metadata, as well as security for minters to be able to mint as expected. This is presented with a polished and working product. Voy NFT Bridge, developed by Jay McCarthy, Angela Canoon, Nick Schellabarger, and Chris Sweener. This project allows for users to move NFTs cross-chain with an interesting angle for being able to use NFTs on Algorand as a memeable DeFi play. By bridging NFTs over to VOI, you can trade them for VOI or VIA tokens, and bridging them back to Algorand, exchange them for ALGO to people wanting to make the trip back to the VOI chain for VOI and VIA. Without further ado, here is the hackathon. All right, so the idea with this, um, why this is needed is that uh, the ARC-72, which is the um, our favorite, um, everybody here's favorite so, uh, NFT spec, the, the major downside is there is no index, uh, meaning that there is no easy way to search and get back information about it. Um, so I <coughs> reached out to actually MG and uh, asked him if he would be interested in building this. Um, the reason why I asked MG is because I knew he had expertise in building indexers in general with the Algorand blockchain. And um, he, of course, uh, said yes. And then we formed a team around him with the Easy Tiger and Flipping Algos, and they formed this team. Um, so I'm going to give a presentation of this uh, the best I possibly can. Um, looks like there's three major components. There's the scanner API, the indexer API, and the presenter a API. The scanner API retrieves NFT data from the Algo, uh, Algo API and posts to indexer. So um, this, this is what it, what kind of what it means is that it's as, as transactions happen, as NFTs move around, there's a listener um, on the actual Algorand blockchain that gathers the information and then posts it into the indexer. The index API uh, writes and reads data from the database. Um, so what this does is that um, as the information comes in, it puts it in the right, uh, right uh, spot, and then also 
then uh, allows people to read from it in a much faster way than what uh, you would be able to read the actual blockchain itself. And then the presenter API, um, I'm guessing this is a completely different um, web interface to make make sure. And maybe maybe it's a web interface, maybe it's the just the way to read it, but probably the web interface to be able to read the the index. So next, they've already put up, put together a API so that people can. Uh, query the information. Uh, they use Swagger, which is a nice interface to make it easy to implement, uh, to actually understand how the API works and be able to visually be able to see exactly what queries you would need to make and what would be returned. Um, and so this does mean that they have an API ready and the link here would be to the Swagger um, interface. All right. Um, so the demo, how it ends up working is that so the Algo API, which is the Algo D API, which is the actual blockchain itself, um, the scanner Node.js module. So he wrote the the uh, the blockchain scanner in Node. It scans the rounds and events as things happen. It's um, it then posts information from the Node.js module to the indexing serverless API. Um, and this this uh, it's a um, a stateless API that's just kind of reads information and then writes data to the, a cloud for Cloudflare D1 SQL instance. So he uses an SQL um, database to store everything in there and then reads data from that. Um, the presenter API uh, will then uh, can actually also pull information from the in, the indexing serverless API to be able to present the information. Um, and then the user uh, would then call the presenter API. So the presenter API isn't the actual interface, it is the um, is the uh, the API that is pointed towards the world. Assuming that it is built and done, um, because he sent some links to it, I would love to actually check it out, um, but it's something that's very important, and I applaud the team for doing as much as they did, and I can't wait to see it in action. Um, he did say that he, he has finished documentation. It's probably that Swagger maybe did some more as well, but I recommend everybody here that's building with, working with NFTs, this guy, and then uh, um, Austin Mitch um, also uh, check that out. And then Shelly uh, with his NFT um, NFT marketplace. And then Kieran, who's here somewhere, I believe, um, uh, when you want to start tying in NFTs into Kibesis. So. Okay, so um, uh, I successfully deployed the bridge, the Algorand to Voy. And uh, currently I set up only the USDC. So uh, I could connect, for example, the Pera in Avery. <laughs> yeah, let's put it here. Um, now it is connected to my Argonauts account. So I can bridge, for example, one algo, uh, one USDC to the void. I can review the transaction. Technically, there is fee open 1%. So the received amount will be 0 0.099. And when I sign the transaction, uh, so now I'm signing the transaction. I can check the transaction. It's, uh, a uh, sim simple asset transfer transaction with the node field. In the node field is information uh, that with the destination address, uh, the token, the destination amount and everything. Uh, so I sign it, I send back to the app. Uh, we run our own blockchain because uh, we need to store this uh, multi-seq data somewhere and uh, it might take more than 1000 bytes and uh, this is done through the Oracle. So we have also deployed the Oracle uh, which uh, tracks the uh, current rounds and speeds of each uh, blockchain that we support. Uh, actually at the moment uh, I am the signator on four servers. Yes, but the, uh, the, I, I would appreciate like more people to be the signatures. <laughs> um, well, the signatures mu must be KYC because uh, if a uh, uh, majority of them uh, uh, collude, 
they might steal the funds from the bridge so uh, we must know like who is a uh, bad actor there the the public configuration looks like there is uh, there is uh, like the configuration address uh, it's one where and everybody can fetch uh, the link to the ipfs where this configuration is at then uh, there is the proofs address so with every transaction uh, we write the proofs uh, uh, address the metadata of the transactions like source and destination uh, transaction uh, ids uh, the claims are mainly for uh, EVM. Uh, the Oracle address where the Oracle data is stored. Uh, the and some address where soldiers communicate. And then uh, there are chains. Uh, there is a uh, Aramid chain. Uh, it doesn't have any 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 tokens at the moment. Uh, then there is uh, the Algorand chain, uh, there is configured only the USDC and the soldiers uh, at the current round are these four addresses. So these are signatures. Is this currently a two-way train? Could I could we send like VOI assets to Algorand and then the vice versa? Yes, it works. So uh, I tested it. Yeah, and uh, technically we have implemented the the uh, EVM and the uh, near blockchain. So technically we can deploy it between any uh, EVM or uh, AVM or or uh, near chain. And uh, basically this algorand part has been audited already by auditors, and we passed the audits. However, we didn't have like enough liquidity to launch to the mainnet. Yeah. So, yeah. Let Let's try the void test to Algorand. USDC. USDC. Um. Uh, no, it's wrapped USDC on boy and the USDC uh, di direct USDC on Algorand. And and then is running a server for the purpose of signing this transaction? Is that is that I mean that's a separate task than running a node than running a relay node. So how how are people incentivized to to set that up and run that? Oh uh, yeah, the the best would be if the soldiers would would run on their servers also the Aramid chain. So if you know like how much does it cost to run void void nodes? Uh, then you might have some idea uh, some portion for the uh, directly for the liquidity providers let's say 30 percent then uh, uh, some 20 percent is shared for these uh, balancers uh, then 30 percent uh, for the uh, for the relay uh, uh, for the node runners for these uh, soldiers and uh, the rest would be like uh, the profit uh, uh, profit of the companies for the shareholders, right, for the owners. Our team is Team uh, Better Bridge. It is myself, Kieran, and uh, Examium. And so essentially what we were building is a decentralized bridge. And the way this is achieved is by verifying transactions have occurred on the opposing network before you mint the asset on the other one via state proofs. <clears throat> and so this, I don't know if I should really go, could, we could dive into how the state proofs work here and at this point, I suppose, but I'll give a, I'll share a diagram which will briefly outline it. So this is just a diagram depicting one network to the other. So not, this is just one directional. To get it to go the other way, you basically flip the diagram 180, right, just to replicate the pieces. And so what it does is it consists of uh, a few different components. So if we start off in the top right, <laughs> network B, let's for instance say is Algorand. Every 15 minutes or 256 blocks, 
uh, a state proof is produced and signed by the participation nodes in the network. With dynamic Lambda coming out, that will come down to, I think, I think maybe it's about 12 minutes, but either way, it's block based. So every 256 block, um, a state is uh, state proof is produced and that state proof spans or can be used to verify transactions have occurred within this 256 block uh, window. And so that consists of a message and the state proof itself. The message of which contains um, essentially the root of a Merkle tree, um, which is actually what's used to do the verification. And the, the state proof part of the um, package, if you will, uh, contains the necessary information to verify the integrity of the root of that Merkle tree. So verifying things such as um, that the number of participation people, uh, sorry, the number, of, what is it? Oh yeah, yeah. First of all, verify that the number of tokens is greater than or equal to 21% of the uh, total online stake. Verify that the people's public addresses are what they say they are. Um, and maybe there's a few other things in there as well, which I can't quite remember right now. But ultimately, the network produces these things. Um, what we did was we built a sort of prototype relayer um, such that what it means is that anybody can come along and basically pick up these state proofs and then submit them to what we are calling Weaver. <clears throat> so Weaver is a Right now, it's just one smart contract, but at a later date, it could be broken down into two separate ones. One of which is to just simply store in boxes the uh, the root of the Merkle tree that I mentioned earlier. And the other part is to actually do the transaction verification. So what would this enable is that other applications in the ecosystem could utilize these contracts to verify if transactions have occurred on the other network, or even if they haven't occurred. So the end of the day is going to return true or false if a transaction's happened and you have to provide the necessary parameters such as the the round that it was um, written in and, and the, you know the transaction id and i think there's a few other things which at this point kieran probably knows a bit more about because he was implementing the logic behind that um and so what this means is that we built a bridge on top of weaver uh, and so examian was was leading the effort on building that side of things um and so what it what really happens is um, there'll be a lock and mint contract again on either either network <clears throat> and i might say deposit 10 usdc on our grant into one of the lock contracts we can then essentially verify via weaver whether or not this transaction has occurred and if it has occurred then the mint contract can be confident in releasing um, usdc on voice side or the other network side of the bridge um, and obviously, we then obviously had to build a, a graphical interface for the bridge, which we're just calling Tower Bridge. So really, we had kind of four main things. The, the relayers, Weaver, the, the smart contracts for Tower Bridge, and the front end for Tower Bridge. Um, and so what's really cool, at least, well, what we think is cool, is the fact that while we have obviously created this, this relayer, anybody could create a relayer to pick up the state proofs as they're produced and submit them to the um, to, to Weaver and basically get paid for doing so. So whoever submits a <clears throat> the state proof in a, in a timely manner and it's verified as being legitimate, they could get paid out. And Weaver could collect fees by not just our bridge utilizing its services, but have other applications too. Um, so we think that that's quite cool, um, basically. So you can have it like very much truly decentralized in the fact that there's no one relayer having to facilitate this. You know, obviously for the purposes of what we built, Tower Bridge is also running a relayer to actually facilitate these things. But at the end of the day, it'd be very interesting to get to that point where there is no one single application that's needed to make this work. Finally, obviously the UI for the bridging, which I'll I'll show you now, and it's 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 kind of laughable when you compare it to Ludo's, but but here we go. This is this is what we have. This was hacked together. The UI probably in the last few hours of the the hackathon, essentially. Um, but also we we managed to get VCs connecting, which was great. Um, but also we, all someone needs to do on the Algorand side is so this is specifically for USDC as well. So one thing actually I forgot to mention was that with it being fully decentralized, uh, if, you know, while we are right now deploying 
uh, Xiaomi has deployed the USDC contracts, uh, anybody should be able to then want to bridge any other assets and pay for the contracts to be issued on either side of the bridge as well. So it's very hands off from the Tower Bridges perspective. Um, but really, because this is specifically for USDC, one would only have to type in a quantity and specify destination address. They would then click bridge, which would then send the transactions to Kabisis to sign. That was the the bit the the bit that we couldn't quite get working was actually submitting the transactions to the wallet, which is kind of funny because that should be the easy part. <laughs> um, but there you go. We couldn't get that bit working. Um, not sure why. I'm sure given another day or even a few more hours, that would have been cracked. But either way, we couldn't get that bit over the line. Uh, and then all that happens is once it's been verified via the uh, the mint contract, verifying with uh, Kieran's um, transaction verifier is we would then be able to claim. So the user would then again, just click this button to claim, interact with the mint contract on voice side, and then the transaction would trigger to send the USDC to their wallet. So that is really what we built. Uh, again, it kind of consisted of four different repos. So we've got the front end, which was just a you know basic kind of React app, as you saw. We have the tower bridge contracts, which uh, Xiaomi and Rit in Reach. So we have the lock contract and the mint contract. Uh, and again, these would be deployed on either side. So even adding in, say, uh, Aramid as well, this would be possible to do so and, and mint, sorry, not mint, but deploy a lock and a mint contract on that side as well. Um, we then had this state proof verification contract, which again, this is what we were just calling Weaver. And this is right now just one, but it was written in PyTeal, just given that we did need to use those new opcodes. Um, and this this is, honestly, I think this is the coolest bit of it, is doing the, the verification of the transactions, essentially, and doing it all on chain as well with the limited resources. Uh, and then, of course, the state proof relayer, which was written in Go. Um, and yeah, that could be picked up by other people to run with. What do you guys anticipate will be the time frame to get it to be fully functional, a UI that you that you like, that sort of thing? So when I was chatting to Inc. to get it fully production ready, that is like a two, three month uh, <laughs> undertaking. So I'm actually quite impressed with how much that was achieved within only two and a half days. Um, because the only thing that is missing is verifying the state proof. Um, that is the big bit in my eyes, because that is the, the more complicated mathematics. Verifying the transaction is complicated in itself, but very achievable. I think Kieran, if Kieran had another, probably honestly, if Kieran had another three hours, he probably could have finished off doing the transaction verification. And then the front end again, you know, to get it to a much better state, three, you know, call it a day just to work out all the sort of like uh, quirks and iron out all the, the problems. The relay was fine as well. So to get it to production ready, probably a couple of months just to actually get it secure. And But the bulk of that is verifying the state proofs. There's no reason why that couldn't be achieved by the time that Void does hit mainnet. What are the next okay. steps? So the next steps, again, would be obviously building a much better UI, um, getting, connecting to the contracts working, which would, again, take nothing, uh, finishing off the transaction verifier. Um, but the, the the main the next step really is going to be somebody picking up and doing the uh, state proof verification. So the relay will send all of that information to the contract, and is actually about implementing that logic onto the contract itself to verify that well, someone hasn't just created the state proof and submitted it because anybody could submit it right from the relay. Um, so we need to actually verify for this to be truly decentralized. We need to make sure that we can trust the state proofs that are submitted to the oracle. So we, we could do it in a more centralized way where we assume that the state proofs are legitimate, but obviously that's not kind of the, the aim of what we want to achieve with this. I think it's important not just for bridging, but for other applications to be able to leverage Weaver. Um, because I think there's immense uh, power in being able to verify whether a transaction has occurred or hasn't occurred in between networks. Um, and you can then extend that to the app states, App transactions as well. And I think at the end of the day, this could actually be at the starting point for a more seamless um, interaction at the higher level, you know, abstracting away the complexities of what is actually here 
for a user. You know, there might be applications on one network or, or tokens on another network. But from the user's perspective, they don't have to care about even the concept of different networks, right? They're just able to use an application and it's able to do what it has to do behind the scenes to enable this communication. Um, so I think the fact that this can be used beyond bridging um, and the way that it can be used higher up the stack, if you will, is, is incredibly powerful. There was a lot of talk around when state proofs were announced, but no one really, it kind of died down. And, and even for myself, I, I didn't really un truly understand the power of them. But I think this really does, this would unlock the it, the true potential of what a state proof can do, um, especially being able to verify a the, the state of a network on chain of another network is 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 really really powerful. But ultimately, the goal of this one is to be fully decentralized, so not to have a dependency on any single entity or to trust any single entity or person to actually facilitate. Uh, the verification that a transaction has occurred. So the, the big value is really from these state proofs that get produced and the ability for people to essentially uh, trust the maths, right, um, is what it comes down to. So that's why in our eyes, it's not necessarily the, the bridge that is the big value here, but it's Weaver. Uh, it's the ability for AVMs to verify that transactions have occurred on the other networks, because I think that opens up um, a very, very interesting opportunity in, for many different, well, many different services that can be built on top of that. Um, so really the difference is the fact that it uses state proofs to do the verification, whereas as we saw with, say, a centralized bridge or you know, even, say, Ludo's implementation is you need the soldiers to verify that, a, or a guardian, I think they're sometimes referred to as well, that a transaction has occurred. And so you usually have like a consensus, so maybe there's like, you know, uh, 21 of them. And when a certain number of these guardians or soldiers agrees that this transaction's occurred, then they're released. Um, which, you know, there's there's no there's no problem with that as well. It's another way to solve the problem. Um, but it's the, the main difference is just in this way, you're using pure mathematics to verify that something has happened as opposed to having to trust uh, entities in, in one way or another. Hey everyone, so yeah, I'm Mitch, um, thanks for having me. Sorry, Aust couldn't be here. I know he would have loved to be around, but that's okay. In his absence, I will do my best to share and present on the stuff that he worked on, stuff that I worked on and talk through it. So during the hackathon, we were building the NFT launch path. And so you're, judges, you're gonna have to tease out a little bit and listen and ask questions to me about stuff that we did build during this hackathon and stuff that we did not, because we came in with, uh, High Forge, which is our Algo NFT launch pad that previously worked and worked well with ARC-19 NFTs, but we wanted to make sure that we had this working well for ARC-72s. As you heard Chris say at the very beginning, you know, we know that ARC-72s are going to be well loved and well received on VoI. And so part of the impetus of having the, the ARC-72 launch pad up early is making sure that we don't have people kind of lazily just copying over ARC-19 things and trying to like rush NFTs over to VoI without kind of trying to make sure we do it in the way that we think will be best for the community and the ecosystem. But again, feel free to ask questions because they, a bunch of like almost all of the UI, for example, you know, already existed. We just had to make a bunch of inner tweakings to kind of swap things over. So what we did though, is we set out to implement ARC-72, which is intentionally actually vague in like what you need to do. And so we did find a lot of room for innovation and I'll get into some of that for how we could facilitate making NFTs on VoI easy, tractable, working well with analytics, marketplaces, et cetera. And then again, we wanted to make it easy both for creators to show up and launch. That's the, kind of the bread and butter of High Forge is you don't need to know how to code. You don't even need to know how to work well with images in order to use High Forge. It's just come in, drag and drop, point and click GUI rules to set things up. And then on the minting side, um, if you're familiar at all with like old school NFTs on Algorand, there was a lot of problems that High Forge set out to solve. And we wanted to make sure that we kept those with ARC-72. And, and some of that that we don't have to go too into detail of, but it includes things like being able to rarity snipe. So, you know, people hunting just for the best NFTs, trying to make sure that they, you know, pay minimum price for best value, turn around and flip gains. You know, we want it to be a fair ecosystem. We wanted also to make sure that we avoid this like signing and getting nothing. 
the early days you'd sign, you know, 100 transactions hoping to get one NFT and sorry, you're too slow. Someone will beat you to it. So we wanted to make sure that we maintain all of those kind of niceties on ARC72 NFTs for HighForge as well. But first and foremost, you're, you're seeing my screen. So we have the ARC72 um, written and published. That's Austin's bread and butter. He wrote it in PyTeal. It's here. Uh, I know Chris always just chagrins a little bit when he hears that. It's written in PyTeal and not in Reach, but sorry. <laughs> uh, when push comes to shove, we got to go fast. It's what, it's what we know and love. So um, uh, we'll get into that, though. So ARC72, there's not a whole lot to it. Like I said, you know, what is there is pretty minimal. Uh, to talk through some of the, what I think are unique innovations for what we did and added kind of on top of what it has is number one, we emit events when mints happen so that any analytic service can quickly just find the log from the transactions and then have all the details that are needed in order to support sales. So, you know, who bought it? What did they pay? Meaning like which asset or VSA? Um, how much did they pay for it? and what number did they get and when did it occur, right? Basic sales functionality. Um, those are super easy to peel out. And in fact, we are dog fooding by doing that ourselves in HighForge. We consume those event messages ourselves um, to be able to show information there. Uh, number two, we have the ability to split payments. We initially have called it charities. That's what was something we had earlier. So we wanted to make sure that we can support charity addresses. So not only does the creator get their cut of the fees, you know, if you want to donate 10%, say, you know, to some foundation, to your favorite project, to a favorite charity um, that's configurable to set up whatever percentage you want to go there. Uh, a really nice quality of life feature, mostly for devs, but you know, some wallet users may care about it, is the ability for the token ID of the NFTs to actually match the mint ID. And being able to do that without sacrificing mass minting took a little bit of finagling, but really proud of the, that ability because it's really nice for a dev to just say, oh yeah, you know, what box is it in? Oh, well, it's NFT number one. Okay, you know what the token ID is going to be for that box. And it's just right there. It's easy. You don't have to have like a complicated mapping. You can just, you know, guess through it essentially because it's going to be right. Um, we did that by making it so that the way it has to happen to still allow mass minting to occur. The problem is that a use, two users could race together and say, oh yeah, you know, I, I'm minting NFT number one, I think. They could, you know, they, they could make a transaction that, tries to do that. And then only one of them would win. That's kind of the original race condition, right? You signed it, but you were too slow. You lost. We didn't want that. And so, but in order to keep this token ID system lining with mint numbers, we have to have like an intermediary step. So users kind of just say, hey, I'm minting an NFT. They get a random temp token ID initially. And then when the NFT is resolved being created, it then resolves to the correct token ID of the mint number that they received. Not too bad, but again, we had to kind of juggle and finagle through that to make sure it all works well, um, but very happy with that. And then something that's not written in ARC72, but that is part of the NFT creation from the launch pad is support for on-chain royalties. That was something that we had pushed early that we were sad we never saw any sort of real adoption on Algorand, which is the ability for an artist to just upfront say in one place, right, this is what I want the royalties for my project to be. And then to give people the opportunity to see and you know choose to respect that again you know i'm not trying to make this a royalty conversation but artists now have the ability to just say it once instead of having to go to every single marketplace that stands up and say oh set the royalty here set the royalty there you know set this royalty it's just here's what i as the artist want for my royalty having done high forge with arc 19s and then seeing some of the pains that came from it you know arc 72 just like obliterates all of those in, in a very clean nice way um as I mentioned, at HighForge, you know, already exists on Algorand. Um, we've moved it over to be like algo.highforge. The main HighForge website now points to Void Testnet. But, you know, we were in there just like cleaning out a whole bunch of project creation stuff. We used to have to do logic SIGs for delegation, you know, for during creation time. And, we, and uh, NFTs used to be able to get stuck in the creator's wallet if they weren't claimed. And, you know, a whole bunch of things that, you know, we don't want people to have to worry about. And luckily with Arc72, that all just kind of disappears. Um, so that was really kind of the, a lot of the innovative steps that we were able to take with ARC72. Um, again, as I mentioned, we'll all step through minting in just a second, but uh, it's live, it works. So a lot of what Austin did was writing the ARC72 contract and then working through with me on how do we make it so the back end of HighForge can accept and handle interacting with the ARC72 smart contract. So we have here on the, again, the main HighForge website, is a we call it test skulls 
So you can see that Aust is the creator of this project. Again, this is just our very minimal description, but when you load in as a user, you can connect your wallet. It'll show you how much VOI you have and how much the VOI costs for a specific project. You can see how many NFTs are available. If you're looking down, you kind of see the ones that are already here. Again, so this is like some of this showing these NFTs, mostly all existed, but we did have to reroute things because before we were pointing to ASAs on Algorand. And now, because we don't have an NFT indexer yet, I know MG was working on that, but we locally have just kind of a, our own internal mapping of keeping track of which NFTs came out of the project. So this is not hitting an indexer of any kind. This is just us serving up from what we know because we do mint from here. We're able to read and, and have those. So minting an NFT is pretty straightforward, but let me make sure that I get my wallet connect set up because I know it expired. Okay, so if I go to Mint an NFT, it'll show me kind of what's going to happen. We go through all the block details. This is another, I guess, minor point for us is that um, Aust is very particular about making sure you pay min fees possible. You know, we don't want to overpay for anything. So part of our process is iterating through and saying, does this need to be this big, right? Does this box need to contain this information? Okay, at this step, you know, why? So we've got our, it's 1.21 initially to be able to set up everything that we need for the new um, NFT. Go to Mint, comes over here, you can up in DeFi, we'll sign it. Give it a second to think, because we've seen if we go too fast, it'll blow up, send it back to the D app. And we're currently minting a new NFT. So minting the NFT very fast, happens quick. And now we've got the reveal step, NFT minted, and we've got the new NFT here from this goal. It looks like, it looks like test goal number seven. And then we have something new that we added was this fix. We do try to track rarity information. Um, these ones are busted because they're old. This is during test. But the rarity information here will automatically update in about 15, 30 seconds, which is another kind of interesting, fun part of the project is going through and figuring out how do you update rarity in a way that makes sense? It is not expensive to do. We learned the hard way from our one of our other collections on Algo Seas that doing rarity calculation the wrong way gets expensive fast. And, but we have a really nice high forge pipeline set up for doing rarity and having it go through kind of a rarity aggregator to make sure they all go through at the same time. And there we see it automatically popped in when it's done calculating rarity number five for the skull. Fortunately, I did not get lucky. Um, so coming again, coming to functionality. So yeah, I know it's a, it's a pretty simple demo, but completely functional. It's here, it's running on testnet. Um, you could go launch a project today, real brief after we go through um, some of this, but it's mostly if you want a bunch of art that has like bad overlapping traits, uh, you know, like if you've got hats, but you've got ears that cut through hats or, you know, sunglasses that cut through the brim of a hat, or, you know, you want mouthpieces, but it cuts through whatever, you know, that's where you can run into problems. And that's kind of the bread and butter of high forge. Again, every, all that did already exist, but being able to go through your rules and say, oh yeah, right, if you're wearing this type of hat, then don't allow this type of sunglasses. Or if your hands are like this, your, you know, your eyes are like this, then don't allow sunglasses at all. Kind of this rules-based approach that everything else that we've seen, is it's all like codified. You know, you've got to know how to program if you want to make those exclusions possible, or you've got to manually build every single one of your NFTs. And that's just a huge pain. Um, so we wanted to have an easier way to do that. And yeah, let's step through that. So if you go to launch a new project, this is where first as an artist, you just shove, we're like, we need your art, right? You got to show us what you've got. If you don't have anything and you want to just play around, we offer you to have a demo of some of the algo skulls that we had done as a PSD file. So you can upload a PSD for Photoshop for those of you who aren't artists like me, um, but you can just directly upload the PSD and it'll import all the layers of traits for you. So if you're creating your NFT, what I'd say is the right way, Photoshop is a great way to try to, to detect early collision and minimize that. So if you have a PSD file, you're halfway there and already making your collection. But then when you preview the image, you'll see these skulls is intentionally messy to show some of the problems. This little fishbowl here, right, clashes with these hats. And so you can go through the hat section and you can edit it and say, oh, well, okay, Either don't always generate a hat, maybe it's a random generation, right? I only wanted to show 50% of the time. And then, well, yeah, hats don't work well with other categories, right? We have to prevent it. So we say, well, we got to make sure that they don't go with the 
bowl items, which are what are they called? Brains, brain items. And then you come to the brain item. I think I have to do this as well. It's been a while since I played around with this. Brains do not play well with hats. And then that's enough, I think, to make sure that hats and brains don't show up. This is an ear, so there's more collisions you got to come back through and deal with. But as, as an artist, you can come through. So if you have no collisions at all, Chris, right, you don't need to get into the rules of it. You just throw everything in here and proceed to the next step. But then we have, again, the ability to preview images. You can, like, fly through them. We have the ability to, you can see these little eyeballs that are here. You can, like, manually change it. So as an artist, you might say, oh, well, what if this causes a collision, right? I want to manually check for this behavior. You can specifically key in what you want to look at the interactions of. So like eyes and glasses maybe is one that I want to. And without getting too into it, we also have tagging. So there's like kind of humans, you know, is it a male one? Males need to have this particular set. So I never want, you know, male body armor on a female character. And so there's like filtering at the categorical level. There's filtering at the trait level and there's filtering on the individual image level. And then we do allow custom one of ones, you know, so maybe the 100th NFT isn't all gold, you know, or maybe there's some other meme place hold numbers, or maybe you just want some random, um, kind of like your lottery NFTs, right? Whoever draws number X gets this or whatever, put in all your stuff, you generate your collection. So here at the top is where we let you review them so you can sanity check, right? The number one thing is people are gonna do these live. So this is the important step. Here's what's gonna be in the collection, not necessarily in this order, but if you don't like it, you can just cycle it out. You know, so you're looking through, maybe you're 99% of the way done, and then one of them doesn't work right. And you're like, well, instead of going back to the very beginning and redoing all of your rules, you just pop it out and you can regenerate it and get a new one to come in. Or this is where you also upload your golds, your one-of-ones, your customs. And if you do upload a custom thing, because again, NFTs are all about which properties are come with which, you know, you upload an image. Well, now we need you to help us know what's in this image. So you can come in and specify the traits for this thing. You know, which background is it? If it's one of the existing ones, or if you need to actually add in a new one, you know, maybe this is called sunset because it's not just blue, green, or red. And then same thing with, you know, the brains. You can see this has got like a little hedge brain, which is not one of these ones. You could add in a unique brain hedge. And then you could also add in existing stuff. Window, for example, you can see is already a window and then save it. And now you've got it in here. You can choose to make it show up in a very specific spot if you want. Like I want the number one mint to be this. You know, maybe it's your own team member or maybe you want it to be a surprise. We have support for either of those. But once you go through and check out your collection, let's skip review. Oh, you also have, here's the pre-stats. You can check here, kind of gut check. You know, if you did a bunch of rule writing, a bunch of filtering to say, oh, I, you know, this trait goes out, this here, we'll show you what got generated. Say, here's how many of each thing got put into your collection, including the custom 101s. And we had those kind of ordered hierarchically where the least shows up at the top. So you can see the most rare traits are here kind of the very beginning and then going all the way down. Once you're happy with all that, you collect your, you go right here and then you would just launch the project. Easy as that. So yeah, if you had all of your art, Chris, you know, you can launch on High Forge in less than 15 minutes. Um, the review step is probably what I would say we find people spend and the most time on, right? Like, cause that's what really matters. Then they want to make sure that each and every NFT like looks good. But we've also seen there's two types of artists, those who have like no collisions and thus they don't care about having their own pre-generated NFTs. They just say, yeah, just throw them in High Forge and then kind of skip right to the review step and then away I go. Or people who are like, oh, this is my first project. I didn't know collisions could be so bad. Okay, now I've got to deal with all the collisions. And so, you know, we see like you see people on both ends of the spectrum. You can, your progress is saved. It's all local storage though. So right now there's no like, cross collaboration yeah it's all you alone and it does save it locally so yeah you can come back iterate people have iterated for weeks on their project to be able to go through along the way to be able to make sure they're there uh high forge does collect an upfront fee to launch a project so you have to pay some void um we haven't settled on the exact amount for what it needs to be 21 uh, it's yeah for 100 nfts Storage is not free nor cheap, but even then, 21 is not bad. I got a million sitting in my test account. So, you know, what's 21 way? <laughs> uh, yeah, but it is meant to be a way to also to make sure you don't get just a bunch of garbage. Um, again, so kind of iterating back, I know pretty much everything you see here in steps one, step two, and step three was just, it existed already. Step four, you know, we had to change because that's interacting with the R72 smart contract and making everything work smoothly there. 
but we're really, really happy with the ability to kind of see and, and re-envision this where it's going to be useful in the way. And we're excited to have it. We think that it's going to be really good for the ecosystem. Again, I mentioned, I think the number one important thing is like getting it right out the gate to say, hey guys, here's a, what I think is a better way to do NFTs, right? Arc 72, you don't have to have a worse user experience. The way that people got around the worst user experience early is having rarity sniping and having the missed transactions. We wanted to say smoothest mint experience possible. And that's possible with Arc 72. So really happy with that. A really great future that maybe you'll be talking about, Chris, at the end for like compatibility of Arc 72s with ERC721. So the fact that these NFTs are Arc 72 compatible, I think in theory means that we could be bridging them to EVM chains easily. Whereas for Arc 19, I think it would be a lot of hurdle jumping in order to make that happen. Yeah. And, and it, I mean, it still is doable, but this is just really nice and clean. So um, we're happy about it. You know, you end up with lower fees, less user transactions. Things can happen quicker. Uh, you know, it, to, it takes like 15 seconds and, and two user signed transactions on Hiveforge to get an NFT. But with Arc 72, it's a single transaction the user has to sign, and we clocked it at like 5.8 seconds, which is just going from mint block to you know the reveal block at the end. So sub six seconds, it's even faster than it was before, which is great. Yes, uh, with the one caveat, which is the only thing that would have problems, is the nodes that are used for submissions. So today, the Void Testnet is, submits via the free node that's available in Void Directory. It's the one run by Algo node. So we're only at their mercy for limitations, uh, which brings me to the second part of like, what's next, which is we're gonna run our own void node nodes for having these things. And especially in the back end, you know, which is the real step of actually minting the NFT, taking what you generated earlier and then taking that, pinning it somewhere and then putting it, the metadata URI onto the NFT. So we will have our own void nodes running for this thing as well. But yeah, as long as we have enough node capability, then we already have infinite scale. We've proven that out pretty well, actually, for some very hot mints that happened back in Algorand with Arc 19, which was even slower. So the fact that we're, you know, Arc 72 is faster, we we hammered it a little bit, but, you know, nothing beats having 100 users show up and try to hammer it all for some free mint. And it would definitely handle it really well, though. So we'll be excited to test that. How long until you are production ready on testnet? It's, it's, I'd say it's broad ready today. The, again, the only limitation is the free node that's being run. As long as that node stays strong, it'll run great. It's ready to use. Launch your project tomorrow, Chris. What did you do unique and uh, specifically for this uh, versus what you already had built? Yep. Thank you, Zyphoid. So yeah, once again, the, the ARC72 smart contract, which we open sourced, that's all brand new interfacing with that smart contract is brand new re-envisioning the last step of this project creation to be able to interface with the new smart contract um, the compilation of the nft metadata needed to tweak a little bit and then in the the hyperge back end again interfacing with the fact that they're now arc 72 instead of arc 19. so again it's a lot of a lot of back end changes of what you don't see there was a few minor front end changes as well for, you know, swapping things out to have Void instead of Algorand. What I'm presenting to you today is the Void NFT bridge. So the, the, the our team, um, Jay, uh, who is actually working on the smart contracts, uh, Angela uh, Canon, Canyon, uh, worked on the design, uh, Nick Shelley, Shellebarger, Shellebarger. Uh, worked on front end scripts and smart contract, and then myself, I worked on the Oracle. Um, so the main th reasons why did we do this project? Um, one of the things I'm actually worried about is is onboarding new people for stage two and stage three of testnet um, for DeFi and the because if, if you don't know, it's that's the DeFi stage and the NFT stage. What specifically I'm worried about is like the new people coming in because say we uh our users launch nft projects or tokens come out their new people are going to go okay i want to participate but where do i get my boy where do i get my via um and we can't really tell them okay well go back in time three months or two months and start running nodes um so i wanted to actually pick a project that fixed that solution next um so built um my solution for that is building an nft bridge uh, between algorand and boy 
and then whitelist NFT projects that have a, a very strong community, a very low uh, floor value, and but are still highly distributed. Now, you might be thinking, wait a second, how does that bring new people into on for stage, stage two, stage three? So how this will work is by, by creating an NFT bridge uh, between uh, Algorand and Voy. This allows for people to um, to buy NFTs with Via, but these the bridge NFTs via. So the idea is like so we pick a a rug project, um, say like Algo Walk. Right now there's next to no value for Algo Walk on Algorands, um, but if you bridge them over, people have the ability to then purchase those rugged uh, NFTs on Boy. Then you might be thinking, wait a second, why would anybody want to buy a rug NFT, Chris? That's crazy. Um, but it's not about the NFT. The NFT is a a value transfer vehicle because now you can buy it with Via or Voy and then ship it back. And then you can then sell that, um, that uh, NFT back on Algorand uh, for Algos because people want to then ship it back here and sell it for Via. So the idea is that we, we are turning these NFT projects that used to be have no value because they are uh, forgotten about or um, rugged or one, um, one reason or another has now the ability to um, to transfer value back and forth from Tesla and um, and uh, Mena Algo. And one of the reasons we actually w want to pick rugged projects is because I think that's meme worthy by by something that like allows us to actually talk about the narrative about adding value back into rugged projects. Um, I think that should make a lot of people excited. There is not much um, risk on if this bridge gets hacked or anything of that sort because they're rug projects anyway. So we didn't want to actually make it so that, you know, sending Mingos back and forth um, or something of that sort because we're like, oh, what happens if there's an issue with the, the bridge? This is why um, we're we are focusing on the um, low value NFTs. Next. So how this exactly works is that an Oracle uh, watches both Algorand and the Voy blockchain. Um, Alice, the person on, on Algorand, sends a payment transaction to the um, Oracle wallet to prepare the NFT for transfer. Um, then Alice sends the NFT to the Oracle wallet on Algorand. The Oracle confirms that they received the NFT and then they um, they mint a the NFT on Voy. And then it sends the NFT to the address that Alice requests to be sent to. Alice then sells the NFT to Bob. Bob sends a payment transaction to the Oracle wallet on Voy. Uh, Bob transfers the NFT um, to the, the Oracle wallet. The Oracle wallet um, then burns that NFT, and then um, on uh, the Oracle tr then transfers the NFT to Bob on Algorand, and then rinse and repeat. Next. Um, so we got the designs done, um, beautiful designs done by Anhala. Uh, this is what it will look like. We didn't have time to actually apply the designs to the application at this point, but as you can see, it is beautiful. Some more um, desktop versions. So who's ready for a demo? Thank you, Benny. At least somebody's not sleeping. Let's go. Thank you, Sackboy. I'll I'll share it, but I guess we're not going to be able to record. So, um, so one of the main things that I really care about is I didn't want to maintain a database. Um, because like what happens if I have to restart the server or anything, what happens to the database? I wanted to be able to um, look at the blockchain and process everything that's ever happened on the blockchain right when you start the start the server up. So right now the server is completely down, but I'm going to go ahead and start it. Um, Shelly has actually sent tons of transactions, re real ones, broken ones, bad transactions, and this and the Oracle is going to sniff them all out and then bring everything up to speed as you watch. We are now fully up to speed. So what this did is, as you can see here, um, went through 100, uh, probably at least 100 transactions, mapped what they all were, and then produced the actual, the correct state of the NFT, depending on which transactions in which order they actually happened. It's um, It popped out, you know, NFTs that he requested that didn't exist, um, transactions that didn't have enough payments in it, 
re, like uh, duplicate transactions and it moved everything up to the proper state. Um, so right now it's up and running. So um, Shelly, if you could actually send a transaction, um, so like, let's do it. Let's do a live bridge. So he's going to go ahead and um, bridge and this, we're watching the Oracle process it. Um, right now, so the the Oracle only looks at the cha chain every 10 seconds. Okay, so it looks like he made the the first transaction to say I am going. I need you to. I want to actually do uh, bridge this NFT, and uh, we're fully opted in. Now, um, now that we're fully opted in, you can then send the Oracle your NFT, um, Shelly. As you can see here, um, what it did is. Uh, we received the asset, we um, we opted in, and now we've just received it, and um, we successfully minted to the the chain. And now, to show that we have NFTs on on uh, Voy, I'm going to stop sharing this screen. Okay, and here's the Voy bridge. These are all of the NFTs that are currently bridged over to Voy from from Algorand. And I'm going to refresh this, and once I refresh it, there should be a new pop one pops up, the one that he just actually bridged over. So refresh, and there you go. This is the the NFT he just bridged over. So now we have so this NFT is now over on the Void blockchain, and um, it, the the NFT representation or the actual NFT itself is safely locked into a wallet. So this is the actual representation right there. It was a blast. I really actually had a lot of fun. Um, I, I, I touched base and stopped in and talked to a lot of you. Um, really, like, appreciate it from the bottom of my heart. Like, the the amount of work that's, that you all put in, I mean, I, I saw quite a few of you working late, uh, working early, um, except for, like, Benny's team, which really didn't do anything. Um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. And I would say that's the, like, it, it's quite amazing, uh, like, the, the talent that we already have so early here um, you I, w I would say that's that's uh, I'm really excited to, to dig in deep and to see what the products you actually built are so thank you and I I hope you all have fun as well 